Small world. Small world. <laughs> Small world. NYC, Omaha, Brooklyn. Brooklyn. I'm from Brooklyn. Love it. Love it. All right. Well, let's get started. We have a ton to cover. I'll be letting people into the room um, as people enter, but let's go ahead and, and get started. And and I'm just I'm so thrilled about today's talk and collaborating with the Black Sinio group. Uh, my name is um, Dr. Victoria Mattingly. Uh, I am CEO and founder of Mattingly Solutions. Um, I have my PhD in organizational psychology, uh, industry experience working at Amazon, DDI, consulting with Intel, American Eagle Outfitters, and I am CEO and founder of Mattingly Solutions. So we are a DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion consulting firm specializing in allyship training, uh, measuring and developing workplace behaviors and um, just giving companies what they need right now in regard to where to get started on their DEI journeys. It's really inspiring seeing a lot of companies that used to treat DEI as, you know, one off, you know, do a training here or there, have some compliance and feel like they check in the box and they're done. That whole landscape is completely shifting. Companies are really starting to get it right and embed DEI into their organizational culture, fabric, policies, practices, and strategies. So we help them build out just those plans to, to execute that work. And so enough about me. Let's get on to our other speakers, starting with Siobhan. Hello, everyone. Thanks, Victoria. Um, my name is Siobhan Holman. I am the co-founder of Black Sinio Psychology. Um, I have my master's in professional studies from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Um, I currently serve as the recruitment and examinations manager at the Maryland Department of Juvenile Services, where my primary responsibility there is personnel assessments and recruitment strategies for the agency. Um, my experience includes recruitment and selection work, test development and validation, um, job analysis and data analysis type work. I'm kind of diving more into the diversity and inclusion side of things. And, you know, being the co-founder of Blacks and IO, we see that there is a big need um, for diversifying the field of IO psychology as a whole. And so I'm just so grateful to be on this call. I'm so grateful to just be doing this work. And I'm so glad to have you all here. Um, and without further ado, I will forward it over to our other panelists, um, Sir Trees. Uh, yes. Um, so I'm Sir Trees. And as I was just talking about, um, live in LA now and have lived a lot of places, Kansas, and got my master's at Radford in Virginia. I've been, um, after grad school, a um, I've been at Org Vitality, and I'm a consultant there. Um, also, some project management experience. So we work in the realm of employee surveys. And so uh, have a lot of experience developing items, and then also just going through that process and then analyzing those results. And this year, um, been having a lot of contact with people wanting to bring more DI pieces into their survey work and um, some focus groups around that to dive deeper. So definitely excited to bring that into this conversation today as well. Um, and one of the big things we actually did, um, I had pulled together a free anti-racist uh, survey for companies this year too. So been really focused on DNI um, and excited to take part in this conversation today. And on the Blacks and IO side, um, I am the chair of the Business Development and Partnerships Committee. So excited to tie in that aspect and how this relates to us and what we do. Thank you both for those lovely intros. So now we also want to know a little bit about who is on the call today. So I'm going to launch a poll with a few questions on here. Uh, there we go. So three questions on there. How do you identify your race ethnicity? Are you an IO psychologist? And are you, a, are you currently a member of Blacks in IO? While you're filling out that poll, once you, once you get that done, go back to the chat. If you haven't had a chance to introduce yourself, let us know where you're coming in from. We'd love to know where everyone is, is residing at the moment, even though we're all living together in this virtual world that we're, we're stuck in. <laughs> About half the groups responded. Take a moment to fill out that poll and then I'll share back the results. I love seeing where everyone's from. Someone from the UK, lots of people on the East Coast, but also seeing some fellow West Coasters. Hello, hello everyone. Go ahead and 
Give us a couple more seconds, answer that poll. If you learn about who's on the call, you just learned about us, it's only fair. <laughs> So I'm going to go ahead and end the polling so we can share those results out. So uh, uh, over 50% of the call identify as Black or African American, 43% uh, white, and um, a few Asian respondents as well. Thank you for sharing that information. We just want to know who, who's calling in today? Uh, are you an IO psychologist? So, uh, you know, for those 19% of you, what is IO? IO psychology, industrial organizational psychology. Uh, we specialize in using data and science to improve the human experience at work. So we're key partners with HR, with executive leaders, and really helping, um, you know, attack some of the, the issues that maybe would be addressed in an MBA program, but coming at it from a people perspective, not necessarily just a bottom line perspective, because we know whenever the people and the talent is working well your organization, you're going to be a more profitable organization. So really focus on, on um, you know, harnessing that people power. Is there anything else about IO psychology, Siobhan or Satrice, you wanted to add? I was just taking notes. I was like, that's a good way to just wrap it up in a bow. So. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, there's, there's two sides. You either are in your organizational side where you're working more with, you know, ensuring that an organization is effective or efficient. And then you have your industrial side that's really geared towards, you know, the data and, and you know, doing the personnel assessment type work, um, striving, you know, to ensure that your jobs are most effective in your organization. But overall, it's just ensuring that you know an organization is operating at its highest success level so thank you for that and then we have nine members of black and of blacks and io in the house hopefully we can increase that number uh, after today's call so thank you for for sharing a little bit about yourselves and let's let's get into the content so let me reshare my screen all right, so a little bit of housekeeping here. Um, first off, please use the chat box. Thank you for those who already shared a little bit about yourselves, where you're from. Feel free to put your, your LinkedIn URL in there and you know, just let's use this as a networking opportunity. It's always great, especially in current world conditions to meet and greet, meet some new people. Um, please mute your device. It seems like everyone has already done that, so thank you for that. And uh, just so you know, resources will be shared at in the replay video. So everyone who signed up for this call, which means everyone on the call right now, you'll get a link to the replay video, um, and then we'll have all of the resources and hyperlinks in the description on that YouTube video as well. So you can kind of just jump jump to the goodies there or rewatch the video, and of course, share it out with your network as well. So. Okay, so inclusive workplace behaviors and examples. So really getting at where does allyship fit into this, into, you know, right now, DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, it's, it's, you know, the key conversation that we're having in the business world, in the market, um, and what, what does this actually mean and where does allyship fit in? So there's a lot going on in this model. Uh, this is the model we use at Anatomy Solutions. I've also done a lot of research in this area, but allyship really is like the creme de la creme of, of when it comes to inclusive workplace behaviors. And just to, to ground us in what it, I mean by inclusive workplace behaviors, I always talk about diversity and inclusion as diversity is who we are and inclusion is what we do and really getting at the behavioral element of inclusion. And, and that really makes it empowering, right? We have opportunities, you can see the very bottom of this model is everyday inclusion. Any interaction that we have with another human, that's an opportunity to use inclusive behaviors. And, and I'm sure a lot of you have heard of the concept of microaggression of the, of the tiny slights, these, these otherwise innocuous things that can actually cause a lot of harm to the target of those microaggressions. But there's a flip side of that called microaffirmations, and that's using inclusive language, getting people's names right, using the right gender pronoun, making eye contact, smiling, turning on your video when someone else is on a video call with you. These little things we can do in our daily interactions that make people feel valued, seen, respected, and heard. Also concepts like empathy and psychological safety, and, and we don't have time to dig into all these right now, but please be sure to hit me up because I have a ton to say on all of these topics. Um, next up the level is inclusive leadership. So I, I believe that you don't have to hold a formal leadership role to be a leader on your team, in your organization, in your groups that you participate in professionally. Um, being a leader is, is being, a, being a role model, um, setting right examples, helping coach and provide direction. We all have the ability to be leaders and those who are in formal leadership positions as well can you know, have the ability to hold others accountable for diversity, equity, and inclusion and 
intentionally build diverse teams? You know, if you're a researcher or a student on the call, do you find yourself writing the same papers or the same group over and over again? How can you diversify the people you're working with, collaborating with, and also how can you role model inclusion? You know, not only talk the talk, but walk the walk. And then finally, allyship. So allyship really gets into, you know, putting yourself out there, using your position of power or status to advocate and support for others, whether it's being a the not being a bystander. So bystander intervention is when we step in and notice whenever there's instances of potential racism, sexism, discrimination going on and, and pointing out and stepping in and doing something about it. Um, not just mentoring others, but sponsoring them, pulling them up to your level in the organization, using your network, using your resources to help elevate someone's career who wants to grow their career, right? And we'll get into that, uh, knowing what people want before you go off and try to help them. <laughs> um, we, don't want, we don't want saviorism happening. And then activism. So what's the different active, activism work you could be doing to help um, advocate for communities that you care about and want to be an ally for. And if you notice on the left-hand side, um, the you know, everyday inclusion, we could all be using them at any time. It takes, it takes um, you know, more maturity, difficulty of use, the higher you go up on this model. All right, so just defining what allyship is, as I mentioned, it's a relationship between an ally and their partner working towards the shared goals of fairness, equity, and social justice. And I emphasize the relation part. If you think about it, one wouldn't call themselves a mentor if you weren't actively mentoring someone. Same goes for allyship. What we don't want is formative allyship happening. Uh, there, I've seen a lot of backlash and just the social dialogue recently about uh, wannabe allies or people, you know, doing performative allyship but not actually doing the work under that, calling themselves an ally. I always like to say, you shouldn't call yourself an ally. Let that designation be awarded to you. It should be the ultimate compliment if someone calls you their ally. And what I mentioned before, you know, having this relationship will ensure that the work that you're doing as an ally is actually meeting the specific unique needs of the person or group who you're trying to serve. And you need to form that relationship to ensure that you're properly meeting those needs. What we don't need is, is people going off and trying to save the day and the actions that they're doing, potentially putting themselves at risk, putting others at harm, aren't actually leading to the impact that they are intending to cause. And the way we can help prevent that is by forming these mutual, ongoing, real, authentic relationships with people who are different than us in some meaningful way. So as I said before, allies use their power of status or the P word privilege. We all have privileges. The fact we're on this call right now, we have access to technology, internet, we know how to use Zoom, we're probably all you know educated in some way we all have privileges that we could be using and the term privilege gets such um it, it causes defensiveness, right? And, and something that really helped me in my own ally journey and learning about my own privileges is privileges do not mean you did not work hard for what you have in life. It just means that there are certain things that you didn't have to work extra hard. Uh, there's a great dialogue about um, privilege in the terms of headwinds and tailwinds and why it takes 30 minutes longer to go from New York to LA as opposed to going from LA to New York because whenever you're flying from LA to New York you have those tailwinds behind you that help get you there faster. And so that's what privileges are and we could be using as allies our privileges to help support and advocate for others. And finally, um, someone's an ally, they need to be an ally, you need to be advocating and supporting someone who doesn't share some key part of your identity. So, um, you know, men can't be allies for other men, women can't be allies for other women. You can do good things and be a mentor, be a sponsor, be an advocate, and all that is great. I want to always support humans helping humans, but it's not allyship unless there's some sort of difference that you're making that you're crossing that divide. All right, and so this is where I really wanna have an open conversation. So this model of allyship and talking about it is this one-on-one -on -one relationship between an ally and a partner. Um, I think it, it's really crucial to know, you know there's certain things and competencies of allies and partners that make for a good relationship. And um, allies themselves, they're, they're curious, you know, they ask the questions, they do the research, they do that self-education first. I always talk about the Google rule when it comes to allyship. If you can Google it, if you can find the answer on Google, do that first. Do not burden others with educating you if you can find the answers on Google. Um, diversify your, your social media consumption, your media consumption in general. Really do the work and the self-exploration to learn about the group that you are trying to be an ally for. Have that curiosity. And then if, if when it gets to the point of having conversations, you know, express that curiosity 
ask good questions, be a good listener, be really curious about um, the, the partner that you're serving in your ally relationship. Having that humility, so being be able to acknowledge things like uh, if, if you identify as white, things like white fragility, white privilege, um, having that acknowledgement that we do make mistakes, that we don't, we can't always get it all right. Uh, being an ally requires having the awkward, uncomfortable conversations and being able to admit whenever we do something wrong to then for apologize and then most importantly change the behavior based on what was learned. And then finally, courage. Ally, allyship requires risk. Um, taking risks, putting yourself out there, leveraging your resources, your network, um, your reputation even. And so having that courage to do that work because changing the status quo is not easy to do. And now I wanted to kick it over to Siobhan and Sir Teresa to talk about the other side of allyship. If, if these are one-on-one -on -one relationships, then what could a partner working with an ally do to lead to an effective allyship partnership? Yeah, so on the partner side, um, there's a few things that people should keep um, should keep in mind. And one of those things, it actually relates back to what you were talking about, Victoria, um, in kind of the opposite of Googling, right? So yes, of course, um, an ally, we want them to go um, and put in the put in the effort and try and do some research on their own time. They shouldn't come uh, to their black friends for everything that they have. However, um, there's something to be said for that being self-aware and trusting of people. If we want there to be a relationship between an ally and a partner, there has to be some kind of connection, some give from that side. And so if someone comes and they truly ask a genuine question, wanting to learn about your experience, being open to sharing that and having those conversations. Um, we're never gonna see progress in this arena if we don't become comfortable with the uncomfortable. That's my favorite phrase when talking about um, allyship and inclusion. Talking about race is a really tough thing. It's hard, there's a lot of stigma around it, but we have to be willing to be open with each other and have those conversations. Now I'm not saying walk up to a random uh, stranger on the street and say, hey, I wanna ask you what it's like to be black. Um, that's a little uncomfortable, but if you have a friend, a colleague, um, a classmate that you're close enough to, that you feel comfortable saying, what have you experienced? Can you tell me about it so I can learn? Um, or, oh, I saw this happen. How did that impact you? And asking those kinds of, con and if they come to you with those kinds of conversations, being willing to have those conversations um, so that they can kind of see it from a personalized perspective and not just, sorry about my dog, um, and not just what they find online. Because as you know, we all have different experiences. So it's nice to broaden that for them and give them other um, ways to learn. But Siobhan, I'll let you add on to that too. Yeah, so I think, oh goodness gracious, excuse me. <laughs> um, I think that's a good point. And it, it, you know, brings back to my perspective on it or my former perspective on what an ally is or should be. And, you know, I've always, felt a burden, right, of educating, you know, my Caucasian counterpart on what Black experiences were. And, you know, it was almost like um, frustrating in a sense to continuously, um, again, educate a, a, a Caucasian individual. But I think you bring up great points, right? Like, do you have to continue the conversation? You have to continue to hold, whether you have friends or colleagues, um, you have to continue the, to hold them accountable, right? So continuing that conversation, making sure that that discussion doesn't stop, um, you know, making sure that you know, your colleagues or your friends aren't just those performative allies, but they're actually really doing the work of an effective ally. So you do have a responsibility as a partner to ensure that, you know, your, your friends and your colleagues are being effective allies. And so, you know, me where I was taking the perspective of, no, I'm going to remove myself and, you know, put all of the responsibility on my, you know, Caucasian friends or my Caucasian colleagues to figure out what it means to be an ally. I think, we, you know, going directly to that last point on partnership, it's a responsibility of us to ensure that we're holding them accountable, right? And that we're continuously ensuring that the conversation is being had in our workplaces, um, that, you know, our friends are taking the conversations back to their families at home, and that they're actually doing work that 
um, will have a lasting impression and not just reposting on social media or doing things that, you know, looks like they're an ally, but they're actually more effective. So I do like this slide because I think that there is um, an important piece here where we have to understand that it is a relationship. Yes, allies have a responsibility, but as us as partners, we also have a responsibility. So. Love it. Anything else to add about just how we can best work together one on one in our allyship partnerships and, and any any other calls before we move on? Yeah, I think I think, you know, going back to your pyramid slide, Victoria, I think it's really important that you outline what, you know, an inclusive workplace looks like at different levels. Right. And I was trying to put myself in the shoes of someone who is receiving, um, you know, I guess, allyship you know, work if you, if you want to put it that way. And I think back to, you know, some of my uh, supervisors who just, you know, authentically wanted to see me win, right? And so every day they amplified my voice. You know, we had conversations where they wanted to know what I um, wanted out of my agency, you know, where I saw, you know, more so succession planning, but I saw or I felt like there was a genuine interest in seeing me succeed, right? And so, you know, that inclusive um, workplace that you, you know, you demonstrated in, in the previous slides, I look back and I say, you know, I think my leaders or my supervisors, they were active allies to me because they amplified my voice, you know, they saw what my goals were in the organization, you know, they mentored me to be the best that I could be in my current role. And they continue to allow me to progress um, in my role so that I can move to the next role. And so I think, um, you know, as you as you outlined in the previous slides, there are levels to allyship, and it shouldn't be, you know, a task, it should be more of who you are as a person, right? And you should be able to do it on on a on a daily basis. So I thought that was great. Yeah, that's, I, that's actually similar. The point I was going to make is that um, just remembering that it's an ongoing thing. It's not, okay, I'm officially an ally, done, check that box. Um, it's something that you're continuously going to work at, and it is um, a relationship, a partnership that you're going through this together. Um, and just, I really, I'm not to just repeat myself, but I want to reiterate the idea of being comfortable with the uncomfortable in that transparency, being open as an ally to say, I don't know the answer, or I don't understand, um, but I'm still here for you. What can I do? Um, or asking, um, I've had colleagues ask me before, hey, um, is it okay if I bring up your race at this time? Like, I, I feel like it is relevant in this situation. And there's times I'm like, no, like I didn't think of it, it's not important, whatever. And then we both moved on and it's fine. And then there are other times where I'm like, yes, like my race is having me like look at this differently. Thank you for thinking of that. Let's have that conversation. Um, and that's when I talk about being comfortable, it's being comfortable. That's That can be uncomfortable for both of us, right? She's bringing up my race and for her, she's like, oh God, I'm bringing up her race. Um, and whether um, just being able to move past that and not thinking, oh God, why did she do it? I know that she genuinely meant well. So being able to just really work together and just move past things and just know that it's all well-intended, you know, and just kind of looking at things with that kind of um, positive lens and coordinating, so. Oh, I love this so much. So in prepping for this call, I was, you know, going through, we were going through the slides and I, and my, my journey with allyship, especially as a researcher and a, and a DEI practitioner started in the gender space. And so I was very comfortable talking about the roles that allies should take and partners should take because I was coming from the perspective as the partner, me as a woman partnering with male allies in the workplace. And where I, you know, in the last, you know, year or so as I broaden out my perspective allyship to take a more intersectional lens and include other areas of allyship like straight allies for the LGBTQ community or white allies for people of color. I'm like, I don't know if I feel as comfortable talking about the partner side of this graph as I did whenever I was the partner. And so to hear these concepts come to life and these beautiful examples from Siobhan and Sertrice, I'm just so grateful for, for you sharing. And then just to highlight really quickly, so the, the relationship and that comfort that comfort with the discomfort, that's really what the trust is getting. It's trusting that even when your ally does slip up that, okay, this person is really trying and we're trying to have this conversation because what I'm seeing now is just people are just shutting down, especially when it comes to politics and just the, the climate of our country at this moment. And we need 
more trust and more conversations, even if we even if it does sometimes result in missteps, result in that discomfort, it's that trust that, hey, we're trying to figure this out together. And even if I can apologize and get something wrong, knowing that like, I, I do have good intentions and thank you for just talking with me through this and, and having that trust. And then the accountability piece as well. So what Siobhan was talking about with that succession planning and, and having, you know, not only accountability held for your allies, but accountability held for yourself. Uh, like I remember, you know, I got a lot of sponsorship and mentoring at, at previous jobs as when, when I was in the role of partner. And then it would have looked really bad on my sp executive sponsors giving me these opportunities if I didn't then step up to the plate. So having that self-awareness that I knew I wanted to rise up in the organization, trusting that they had my best interest in mind, and then myself being accountable for then following through on the opportunities that were provided to me. So thank you so much for sharing those examples. I'm just, I love seeing this model come to life, especially it's starting in a gender lens now taking a more intersectional role and then talking explicitly about it um, in the race lens. So thank you for that. All right, so moving on um, real quickly, because I know we, we have some great resources. I wanna make sure we have enough time to cover those and also get to the audience questions as well. But um, I remember when I first started talking about allyship and different presentations and just kind of testing out um, you know, what the definition is and what these actions should be, people talked about, well, you know, can I still be an ally if I just engage in those micro affirmations that we talked about earlier? If I have an opportunity to amplify someone's voice, like, am I only an ally if I'm on the lines, you know, leading all the protests and, and, and only shopping at, you know, women owned or person of color owned businesses? And it's like, the answer is yes, it's all of the above. And the way that we talk about um, innovation in the business world, there's big I innovation, which is like the iPhone and the internet, but then there's little I innovation with these incremental progress, these incremental changes that improve processes and in our innovative little mini innovative breakthroughs. Same thing with allyship. There's the big A allyship, which involves a lot more risk, a lot more time, a lot more resources, has a lot more impact. So, you know, it, it pays off. There's also little A allyship, the everyday interactions that we can do as allies. Um, but none of these actions make sense if you don't have that relationship with the community or with the individual who you're trying to serve. And then thinking about, you know, as Sertree said earlier, allyship is an ongoing, a long-term process. Same with DEI in general. The days of the check the box are behind us. It would, it would be like saying, okay, well, we did leadership at our company. We're done now. No, you do. Leadership is embedded into the company. HR is embedded into the company. Your strategy is embedded, and so is DEI, and as is allyship. Um, that being said, you know, providing one-on-one -on -one support, um, mentoring, sponsoring these ongoing relationships, also um, activism that you could be doing at an organization. So championing HR change, inclusive design, so making sure your systems are leading to equitable outcomes. There's also moments for in the moment allyship. So amplification is a great example. So you're at a meeting and uh, someone who made a point, that point wasn't registered, it wasn't acknowledged. Someone else then even took credit for that point later. It's like, no, 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 no. Siobhan made that point. Thank you, Siobhan, for making that point. Let's make sure Siobhan gets the credit for that point. You know, it's, it's amplifying voices that sometimes get unheard, you know, based on the context, the group, the, the you know, the situation. And then there's also in the moment um, interventions that you could be doing as an ally. So the bystander intervention I talked about earlier, actually stepping in whenever there's instances of discrimination, racism, sexism, um, ableism, whatever ism going on, stepping in, saying, calling out this, this isn't, this isn't, this isn't cool. And there's a ton of resources online. Um, Holler Back is an organization that has a bunch of bystander intervention resources, and we'll include that in the resource list as well. So. Um, and then I wanted to kick it over. This is broad ally actions, intersectional, but what about ally actions for the Blacks in IO community? Yeah, thank you. And before I get into this, um, Victoria, I have to deem you an ally of Blacks in IO. <laughs> um, and we want to just thank you for allowing us to be on this call. And when you asked us, you know, what does allyship look, for, look like for Blacks in IO, you know, we really took Macy and I, some time to really think about what we needed from our allies, and you know, you know, just giving us giving us this space 
to amplify, you know, our mission, amplify, you know, what we have going on is a great start and we really appreciate you. So I wanted to thank you for that. Um, <laughs> but um, Ally Actions for Black Sanayo, what can you do, you know, on an ongoing basis? You know, recognizing your privilege is going to be important. Understanding your privilege doesn't necessarily suggest that you've never had a struggle in your life, right? And we kind of talked about privilege before, um, but rather that your the color of your skin um, has not necessarily contributed to your struggles. And I think once allies begin to recognize that, then they are less likely to be defensive and be more open to, you know, those constructive and effective dialogues and conversations around um, these, these uncomfortable topics. And so recognizing your privilege is going to be um, a big one. Um, number two, um, I think an effective ally is someone who um, you know, doesn't remain silent. They use their voice and their platform to start to facilitate those constructive conversations, whether that's in your workplace, um, whether that's at home. Um, I think an effective ally has the ability to confront the ways that racism perpetuates in their own communities, right? So, um, you know, whether you're starting these conversations at PSYOP or you're starting them with your friends over lunch, it's important to begin these, to have these tough conversations and also confront problematic behaviors and language that you encounter, you know, on a daily basis. Um, third, I think, you know, a, an effective ally should become familiar with Black experiences, right, by reading, watching, listening, um, to different content that's produced by Black people. And um, we talked a little bit about this, but educating yourself on the experiences of the Black community is going to be important. Um, you know, you don't want to just continue to ask a person of color, and I kind of mentioned this <laughs> earlier, to educate you, but, you know, definitely using Google and whatever other resources you have to really educate yourself and put in the effort to be as an effective ally as you can. Um, and lastly, using your platform to amplify Black voices, right? Understand that your voice reaches more ears. Um, so listening to the Black community and offering support where you can is going to be important. And those kind of reiterate a lot of the points that we've talked about already in this discussion. But overall, um, on an ongoing basis, these are some things that you can do. Um, more so in the moment um, for Black Sanayo, we are encouraging you all to become official members of the Black Sanayo community. Um, all are welcome. Black Sanayo is open to Black IO practitioners, um, students, academics, as well as ally members. And so, you know, um, supporting us by becoming official member is going to, you know, really be a great start to being an ally. Joining one of our committees to pushing our mission forward, it will be very helpful. Um, amplifying us by following us on our social media platforms, um, whether that be our LinkedIn group or our Instagram. And, you know, just liking, sharing, commenting, reposting our content, sharing our events, participating in our events. Um, all of those things are going to really be helpful to us. Um, also, making a financial contribution. Um, that'll help us reach our goals, help us to, con to continue to push our events forward, um, you know, help with our administrative things, such as our website and different um, conference platforms that we're using. Um, and so if you're interested in donating, you can visit our website to do so. And lastly, to be an effective ally for Blacks and IO, we need to demand the change, right? And so we're asking that everyone goes out and votes um, on or before November 3rd, November 3rd, excuse me, so that we can see the change that we want. And so now we want to hear from you all, right? You heard a lot about us. We put allyship into this cool construct of what it looks like. We've given you some ways of being an effective ally, but now we want to open the floor to you all. Um, you know, answering one of these, one or all of these three questions, you know, what do Black professionals want allies to know? What do aspiring allies want to know about supporting Black peers and colleagues? Or if you just want to share one of your success stories on, um, you know, what allyship looks like, whether that's in your organizations, in your household, or, you know, just amongst your friends, we want to hear from you all. So if you want to unmute your phones or your computers and just, um, you know, we'll just have a discussion for about, let's say about, what you think, um, Victoria, about 
10 minutes or so? Yeah, yeah, let's take about 10 minutes for this. And I'm gonna repost, I, I just took off the screen so I can see everyone's faces. Um, feel free to turn on your video at this time. Um, we really just wanted to, to hear, you know, your questions um, and also your success story. I feel like we don't have enough, we need more positivity in this world <laughs> right now. That's another reason I personally was so drawn to the concept of allyship, because even though it is so important to know about history, systemic biases, microaggressions. We need to know the problems we're dealing with, but what I feel like is sorely missing in the DEI space is, you know, what can we then do about it? And so let's mm -hmm. talk about success stories. Let's talk about questions that you have. Um, go ahead and I will um, copy and paste the questions in the chat so we have those available too. So we just had one question pop up. Um, in your opinion, what is the top issue for amplifying Black voices, specifically in I.O.? More faculty, more publications, et cetera. Um, so that is a good question. Not sure if you two have anything to say on that one. Um, but I would say in I.O., part of it is just being able to find each other can be some of it. So that's one of the things where Blacks and IO is hoping to come in and why we're looking for that help to amplify our presence so people know we exist because um, it's, it feels like a predominantly white field when you come into IO and it can be hard to find um, mentors in our space that look like us. And so um, starting Blacks in IO, what I often see on our posts and comments from people who when they find us is, oh my gosh, I didn't know there were that many other Black people in this field. I've been looking for you. I'm so glad I found you. Um, so I think that is good us finding our own connection within ourselves but then also then partnering with others so making sure that um you can go to any college campus and find like a, a psyop a student psyop group or a student apa group or things like that bringing those um bringing that blacks and io to the student campus right and then working with those existing bases that psyop apa to have our voices heard on a larger scale so it's one having us find our own presence and find our own ground to stand on, but then coordinating um, with, with our allies to, to be able to have our voice more amplified. That's what um, I think. Is there anything you guys want to add on that one? Yes, yeah, Patrice, I think that's great. And um, I, I would just add, you know, allowing Black professionals to occupy leadership roles, right? Whether we're talking mm -hmm. about in PSYOP or in your, you know, organizations, giving us that opportunity to, you know, be in that space to, to make that change and offering a, you know, offering um, the opportunity for a Black person to lead PSYOP, you know, or a Black person to um, implement new initiatives in PSYOP. And so I think, um, or, or like us, you know, allow us the space to start on our own organization, right? And so, you know, when it comes to amplifying Black voices, it's really just creating a space for us to thrive. And I am so grateful as the co-founder of Blacks and I.O. to, you know, be in a space where we are supported, where, you know, our events are amplified, you know, where the content that we're trying to convey to the greater I.O. industry is being shared, right? You know, each month we do a spotlight member where we're highlighting Black I.O. professionals or students who are doing work in the I.O. industry. And then just seeing that information just circulate throughout, you know, different, um, organizations, you know, on their pages and, you know, a lot like Victoria, she'll repost and, you know, just seeing how, you know, this information is circulating is really warming and it's really um, reassuring that we're, we're off to a great start. So hopefully that answered the question. Yeah. <laughs> no, actually, one of the things you said made me think um, we, one of our like standard questions we pose with like success stories and such, right? So with PSYOP that they have Derek in there now in, in the diversity role is one of the things that was so exciting to see a person of color um, in such a high standing position and that they're calling up um, attention to it and trying to make it a priority. It made it seem much more that they were walking the walk and PSYOP wasn't just talking the talk because um, it can feel like that sometimes. So that was exciting. Um, I know similarly, I, for the question we posed to 
give you guys a little encouragement to speak. One of my own personal success stories um, was internally at my organization. We didn't have a DI committee at all or anything like that. And we're a smaller company. There's about uh, 30 or 40 of us. So kind of made sense. But with everything going on in the world and we're a global company, I was like, we, we need something in place. So I started, I just kind of reached out to my CEO and said, hey, I want to do this call on allyship. Um, to teach people things. And he said, of course, yes. <laughs> and so I did that. And the next thing I know, that kind of spiraled into me creating a DEI committee and heading that. And so that's just something for me to say, like, what do Black professionals want? Create a space if it doesn't exist. And it doesn't matter what your role is. I don't, like, we don't have a formal HR structure department or anything. So I just took the initiative and stood up and said that. And as a partner, sometimes it's good to stand up and have your voice heard. And then as an ally, like my bosses, it was important for them to give me that space. And the whole time through everything, they were just like, okay, sure. I think this is a great idea. What can we do to support you and make this happen? Um, so I think on the professional side, that's just an example I wanted to share. Um, but now that we've rambled for a bit, anybody else want to come off of mute and tell any of your own little stories? I saw a few people show up on video. Hello. <laughs> Got some more questions too in here. Hi, this is Crystal Perrell. Hi, Crystal. Good morning, everybody. I, I'm in Tennessee, so it's still morning technically. I'm guessing on the West Coast too. Um, that's something that we, my organization, I work at Prescott Associates, and there um, do a lot with healthcare settings, particularly, and something even within our organization we noticed is that, you know, as this was coming around, we developed a um, DEI committee, but it still feels very clunky in terms of, you know, we've got things going and we have folks kind of getting in and we have these different work streams within it, but it just doesn't seem integrated. I was just curious if you guys have thoughts or best practices of how you can really start to lay a good foundation as you're kind of beginning that path, even within internally, because eventually we'd want to share that also externally with clients and help them kind of build those practices into their organizations as well. Mm -hmm. All right. Curious, okay. well, do you have an executive sponsor for the DEI work that's going on? We do. Okay. Because sometimes, you know, I feel like one of the biggest barriers at the very beginning of doing a lot of this work is getting that executive buy-in from the beginning and really leveraging those executive resources um, to have it be viewed as this is, you know, mm -hmm. crucial to our overall strategy as opposed to like something that just lives in HR or just lives in its own committee work. And um, I'm also curious, are there people who, are there dedicated resources or is everyone kind of doing this on a volunteer basis? Yeah, it's definitely, right now it's more ad hoc and it's folks who are volunteering and expressing interest within the organization. Um, but we've brought in a new CHRO um, who is, a, you know, woman of color, which is really exciting. So, and she has a diversity and inclusion background. So I think it'll be interesting to see how she kind of filters that throughout the organization as well. So that's something that's really exciting and new as of like this week. So that's great. I think we'll you, see. Tracy, did you have something to add? I didn't want to. Nope, you're fine. <laughs> I was just going to ask some questions, but that was great. Any, any other advice for Crystal and her initiatives? Um, I would say, yeah, just a big thing is finding what you really want your purpose to be for that group, because depending on the organization um, and what other initiatives or uh, committees you may have, there, may, there could be some overlap, you know, so just finding, um, for, for what I did, my key point was first finding what are my goals. What are we trying to do? And then from that, we were able to branch out and say, okay, this is what we want to target. So just for example, one of our goals was um, our uh, social responsibility. So we, like I said, we are a survey company. So we work with people in this space. So outside of internally, what do we want to be doing for the community? So we wanted like standard um, demographic items that we're recommending to people um, that come to us for survey work and things like that. So we had some specific, once we had our big goals, we could then drill down deeper into what might be useful. Um, another one, for instances, like just equal opportunity. So again, we're a smaller company, so we don't do selection often. Um, but when it comes up, being a smaller company, a lot of it is, hey, you know this person, recommend them for a job. Well, I'm the only black person at Work Vitality. So 
you tend to know people who look like you. So that's not the best way to get a diverse pool. Um, so we're like, okay, well here, now we know like, what can we do? And so, yeah, I would say get your big bucket goals and don't have too many, three to mm -hmm. five. And then once you have that, start drilling down. That's my best advice for that. Perfect. Thank you guys. Yeah, no problem. I do want to quickly address Rebecca's comment in the chat. So um, she pointed out how there is a special issue coming up in JAP regarding racism at work, but the majority of the contributors identify as white. Um, and what should be done to, you know, remedy the situation. Um, I think this is a perfect example of that big A allyship and just kind of like, going for it, having the awkward conversation and really intervening and, and, and pointing it out. And sometimes it really does just take starting with the data, you know, because like, I'm sure whoever the editor, whoever is in charge of pulling together these contributors, it was it wasn't an intentional miss, right? And no one, no one, I, I highly doubt this person said we're going to make sure the majority of these contributors are white. So that that did not happen. I can guarantee it. But what did happen was there was a blind spot, and this was a missed opportunity. And so um, it's pointing out, hey, X percent of our contributors do not identify as black. Do you think we have a missed opportunity here to really get the voices of those who can speak to personal experiences um, of, of, this, of this work? You know, uh, do we have a missed opportunity? Can we push back uh, the application date? Or, you know, can we, you know, what can we do to remedy this now? And, and I, always, I always say when it comes to having these conversations and these like call out moments, really lean on questioning, um, you know, have them answer the questions because what, what ends up happening is, you know, defensiveness comes into play. Well, that's not what I meant. And these are the people that responded or you get, you know, the mm -hmm. Wells Fargo CEO said, there's just no people of color to hire right now. It's like, okay, no, no, no. We're not calling out. We're not, we're not calling you racist. We're not like, let's not go there. Let's just start with the data and say, how can we get these numbers to look better by having more people of color as, as contributing authors to this really important special issue at JEP? Um, yeah. And that, Siobhan, I, yeah, I actually with this, I, I know what this is and I actually considered putting something out there for this, but I didn't. And there was a lot of factors. Um, and I think that's probably what happened. So just again, to pull on my own experience a little bit, this call came out the same time that people were trying to pull together their submissions for PSYOP. I feel like every person I've spoken to, their September and October were really busy professionally as well. Um, there's a lot going on in this space right now. So people are getting calls from other areas. I think what occurred was just poor timing and a rush planning and looking at the, um, the, the call for the proposal, there were pieces, and again, this is just a general conversation. There were pieces that weren't necessarily clear or maybe people didn't have the data because it is a journal, right? And a lot of times journals are more um, scientific and you have your research that you did. And so people maybe just didn't have what they needed to get this done in the format that they maybe thought they wanted even though they were, they did try to make it clear that it could be a more informal, it would be a more informal issue. So I think people maybe had preconceived ideas though, that what they had wasn't re relevant. Um, so I, yeah, I think, I think there were just a lot of things in play for why the contributor, contributors might have come out, came out how they came out. Um, but yeah, Victoria, I agree with you. It's just once it gets there and you're looking at it, and you're like, okay, the deadline came. This is what we have. Now what do we do? Maybe you just say what's more important, getting this out on time of the schedule we originally intended or let's open this back up, let's target, let's go out and say, hey, we really wanted some more um, diverse voices. We don't have that. Is any, it, can anyone else submit? And then like broaden your definition of what the submission is if need be, or clarify that to get those people to wanna come in. That would, that would be my recommendation if they were looking for something, if they want to potentially change what happened. Um, yeah, and I think I think we see this, you know, this the journal being one example, but we see this often, right, where we're talking about diversity in our research, and we realize that there's no representation, right? And so I think Rebecca, um, you know, you would like if you, to me, being an effective ally, I think it would be great if you were proactive using Victoria's 
um, example, you know, you have to have those uncomfortable conversations, right? But being proactive, you know, maybe reaching out to see who could potentially um, contribute to that journal, right? And so maybe reaching out to Blacks and I.O. and say, hey, you know, I noticed that there weren't any Black individuals participating in this journal. Would you um, consider, you know, putting this opportunity out to your network and seeing if anyone is interested in participating? And although they might not extend the deadline, you know, just giving, um, you know, individuals who might not even know that the opportunity exists, you know, that that exposure to that opportunity. And so I think when we find these, you know, these different opportunities, that they might not get to those networks, right? And so Blacks and I.O., we're trying to serve as that vehicle, serve as that catalyst to ensure that these Black professionals are getting those opportunities, right? And you as an ally, if you if the opportunity stumbles in your lap or across your desk, then you're reaching out, to, you're reaching back to pull forward, right? And saying, hey, let me go back to Blacks and I.O. or these different networks that I know and see if there's anyone that might be interested in participating in this opportunity. Maybe they haven't heard of it, maybe they have, but let me encourage them to participate because what I'm seeing is that there's no representation on here and there's an opportunity. And so do Doing that, you know, kind of amplifies us, as we were talking about earlier, and giving us that opportunity to really come forward. And, you know, using um, Sir Teresa's example, if she would have heard from Rebecca or heard from, you know, us as Blacks and I.O. by way of Rebecca, you know, that probably would have encouraged you to submit, right? Where you had the idea, but you didn't push forward, you know, knowing that there was an opportunity that they needed that Black representation, Sir Teresa probably would have contributed. So I think, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a lot of opportunity as an ally for you to, and, and you use Blacks and I.O. because we have this network of, of individuals who are eager for the work and, you know, just might not know that the opportunity exists. So that's what I, I have. Yes, yeah, so yeah, and Rebecca, quick, if it's not too late, <laughs> definitely uh, reach out to the Blacks and I.O. To, for the reviewers. It, it seemed like the question was specific about reviewers and that's an even, that's an even quicker fix, right? Because like yeah. reviewing, that's, that's a way l lesser lift than, than the, the authoring. And hopefully the author, the authors are, are more diverse than this conversation. Right. This is a great conversation and it's a great analogy for, for hiring as well. You know, if, if, if my recruiters come to me with a pool that is not diverse, you better believe we're not moving on to the next stage of that of that selection process until we have a more diverse pool from that from that initial first phase so it's, it's it's similar concepts just different different contexts i love it i'm very aware of time though i saw ashley had her mm -hmm. hand up so i just wanted to to address what she wanted to contribute and then uh, wrap up the presentation before we hit the top of the hour but i love this i could talk all day about this i'm loving the conversation but ashley go ahead yeah hey um I still on the on the same subject of what we were just talking about. I guess I just wanted to um, um, see you guys. I guess I was looking for a little bit of advice. So just long story short, I, I'm in school. I, I just started my first semester and uh, in, uh, uh, doing a master's, and we have this group project. Um, and so the project, the topic is racial microaggressions. And there's four of us, three of us are black and one person is a, is a white person. And, um, and I like her a lot, I've complimented her a lot. I always had thought she was an ally or, or you know, I, I think she could, I told her, I was like, you know, you have potential to just do a lot for, for our community. But there's just been a lot of issues lately. And I know you guys are talking about um, maybe calling people out or, you know, what, what happens when, like, for example, like, she just has a personality, she's very assertive, which is cool and all, but she just takes over the entire group. Really, I'm kind of like, you know, everyone, you know, we all have voices, but I, I'm, I, I speak, try speaking out the most. And then she kind of just does a lot of pushing and try, try to lead, which is fine nor in normal situations, but we have four black people in the entire class and three of us are in the same group about racial microaggressions with a person who's white trying to leave that group. So we just had, so I just had a conflict, a little confrontation with, with her like uh, last week. And so I'm wondering what you might suggest on how to approach. Um, as of now, I'm still trying to balance and um, with, you know, first just now starting graduate school and then all this other stuff and then now having to deal with this. And normally, like I've already deferred, kind of backed away. I just try to focus on this, but I don't want to, I don't think it, 
I'm wondering what I should do because I, I don't want it. I don't, like I said, I like her a lot. I, uh, I think she has potential, but I don't want to defer because yeah. I don't think it's, yeah. I don't no, know. This, is, this is a great opportunity, right? And I think, mm -hmm. you know, that's why I really, when I talk about allyship, I talk about that one-on-one -on -one relationship and research does show if you have those tough conversations that we keep talking about, like the theme of, of, of today's talk, you know, having that one-on-one -on -one with her and really starting from the place of, I see what you're trying to do. I see, I know, I know where your intention lies. Um, and we can all agree on the fact we want to do well on this assignment and like, let's use this as a great case study. And like, can I, can I share some feedback with you with how it's been going? And just like going there, having that conversation, um, doing it one-on-one, -on -one, having that, that shared um, what's your shared goal to do well in the assignment and to, 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 to do good by social justice and, and you know and what can we be doing as IOs to help mitigate microaggressions and, and mitigate systemic bias and so just like really grounding in that bigger picture those higher goals um, you know having that empathy recognizing that maybe that first conversation will not go as well as maybe you hope and, and, and creating the space to have conversations moving forward. Anything quickly to add to that, Siobhan or Shatrice? Yeah, I just wanted to say, you know, you know, definitely reach out to us um, outside of this event because, you know, that's what Blacks and I.O., that's one of our missions is to, you know, gear you all with the tools and the language to be able to have those courageous conversations, right, in the workplace, in school. And so, you know, offline, we can talk about this. You're not the only one experiencing these issues, right? We have a lot of people in the workplace, in school, who have very similar issues and who can, you know, bounce off ideas on how they've handled those situations. And so that's really what Blacks and I.O. is about right for us to come together share our experiences and then equip each other with the tools and the language necessary to be able to combat these issues and so offline if you want we can always chat um you know about this issue and see how you can resolve it but definitely don't allow it to you know get you away from the task at hand which is doing the work right and, and just excelling as a as a black person so but definitely reach out to us and we'll we'll talk about it offline Okay, yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. Oh, you're meet. <laughs> We're going to share all of this content in the YouTube video replay in the description. Um, but are there any key points on here? Shatrice or Shimon, you wanted to call out? And I wanted to make sure we got to our call to action slide because I feel like that's yeah. the that's the most. Nope. Uh, just the quick glance on this slide is just some ideas for, again, how to be that ally at work. So I gave my example about, you know, some programming and then there's things in here that we've discussed, mentorship and so on. So um, you can review it later on and let us know if you have questions. Excellent. And then we have some really great resources here. Once again, those will all be available on the YouTube description with the hyperlinks in there for you. All these phenomenal books and films. Uh, definitely, this is this the self-education piece when it comes to allyship, uh, podcasts, uh, organizations, movements. Uh, I feel like we covered a lot of questions, but you have our contact information. Feel free to reach out. Um, I, I love these conversations. I love having them. And it seems like they're just phenomenal resources and community in the Black Snio group, especially for questions just like yours, Ashley. And then finally, a call to action. So let, let's let's leave it with leave it with this. Yeah, so um, how can you help? What can you do to be an effective ally right now? Um, we ask that you support us. Again, becoming an official member of Blacks and IO, all are welcome, whether you're an ally or you are a Black professional or student, joining Blacks and IO is going to be a great way um, to support us in our initiatives. Um, amplify us, learn about our organization and follow us on our social media platforms. Um, uh, Blacks and IO is our Instagram. Um, our LinkedIn, we have a LinkedIn group, um, Blacks and IO, and also you can learn more about our goals and initiatives on our website, blacksandiopsych.com. And lastly, as I said before, demanding this change, this is going to be very important um, to change the current uh, nature of our nation. Please vote. If you can vote early, please do so. But by November 3rd, we have to demand this change. So um, we thank you all for being here. You all are, you are here because you want change. You want to be an ally. You want to see how allies can assist you. Um, and so let's just all continue to work together to, to have, you know, a better harmonious, you know, nation. <laughs>
Love it. Thank you so much for joining us, for being here today. A special thanks to Siobhan and Sertrice for everything that you contributed to this conversation. I feel so like, honored to just like be a part of this conversation. Thank you for including me and in all the incredible work you're doing. Even just, you know, and thank you all for being here. It's one, this is one drop in the bucket of your overall allyship journey, uh, whether you're an ally, you're a partner, and chances are you're probably both in a lot of relationships. Uh, those roles are, are easy to to flip just in one conversation, but we're so thrilled that you joined us today. And, and thank you all and feel free to reach out, um, connect with us on, on the, all the different groups you saw for Blacks and IO. I can also be found on LinkedIn and mattinglysolutions.com. So thank you all and have a great day. Thanks. Okay, I'm going to stop.